the Cambridge Film Festival Video Journal. Uh, tell us when you are recording now, are you? I am, yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, <laughs> Awkward <hello>. start. <laughs> it's, uh, it's day seven of the 35th Cambridge Film Festival. The sun is out, which is uh, maybe the first day I've been able to say that. Um, I'm joined up on one of these uh, secret balconies in the Arts Picture House uh, by the lovely uh, Jason Wood. Hello, Jason. Good afternoon. It's not very often that they're called lovely, so oh, we'll make an exception. We're already off to yeah. a good start. Yeah. Um, so, Jason, you have braved the roads of Britain and you've driven down from Manchester. Uh, that's right, I've driven from home in Manchester, where I'm the um, programmer. Um, and it's interesting for me, I used to have quite a close association with Cambridge Film Festival. I used to do pretty much all the Q&As uh, for Tony. And I think this is the first time I've been back here, probably for 10 years. Okay. And Cambridge has changed a lot, but the thing I like is the festival hasn't changed a lot. I think the Cambridge Film Festival is programmed by Tony Jones and his team, Iris, Bill Lawrence, is completely uncompromising. Um, and I really admire film festivals that don't compromise. I mean, obviously there are some bigger titles, they had Legend with Brian Hegelin, but also there's all this interesting stuff which goes on underneath the Victor Sorgenstrom stuff, which I think is brilliant. Uh, and I think it's rare these days to have a festival which is genuinely interested in showcasing films which may not ordinarily be shown. Most film festivals, and I'm not going to name names, even though they're great, they're quite often just a, a kind of showcase, an advertisement for films which are just about to be released. And that's not something I get the sense of at Cambridge. I think Cambridge really delves back into the archives and it really does look to present under, underseen and undervalued work. And um, I think it's much to its credit that it, it still does that. Of course, when our surprise film turns out to be Spectre or Star Wars. Oh, no, that's not good. Well, the, you know, the thing is, it's a balance. You know, any festival, any programming job, is a balance, you know, to, 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 to be able to do all the interesting stuff, the Victor Sorgenstrom stuff, you also have to put the films that do bring in a lot of people. Uh, uh, and I think it's fine to have that balance and it's fine to have that compromise, as long as you're not always compromising. Um, I don't think we should be sniffy or, or, or snobbish about mainstream culture. You know, I think mainstream culture and highbrow culture can be bedfellows, they don't have to be opposites. Um, but I do think there needs to be a balance across the board between the bigger profile films directed by big name directors with stars and the films by people you may not have heard of featuring people you may have never seen in anything else before and I think Cambridge really tries that balance very well. Well we, we last met um, in the south of France in a little film festival called Cannes and I know there was a lot of discussion uh, this year about the choice of films where they got which uh, strand of the festival they got put in and yeah. the reasons behind that. Now Cambridge uh, takes place at the same time as Toronto and Venice or that's so all on the same time as much. So would you say out of those three, because Cambridge is a bit smaller and it can be a bit more picky in the film to bring up, it's, it's a very interesting one for, for people that live in, in the area of the country? I think it's terrific. I mean, I, I got talking to a guy, I mean, I, I'm, I'm presenting, I have been presenting three films here, and I got talking to a guy down at the bar who came to see The Reflecting Skin by Philip Ridley last night. And he didn't know anything about the film, he just went because he liked the sound of it and because he hadn't seen it or even heard of it. Now, a festival like Cambridge, gives the opportunity for people to discover things. And, and I think, you know, this guy, his name is Philip Ward, he's a travel writer. He is local, and he was telling me that if he could, he would go to every single film. You know, obviously, because there are different screens, you can't see everything. But he wants to discover as much as he can. And that's the great thing about Cambridge. But it does also, as well as being from local, I mean, I've driven over from Manchester, and you've got filmmakers coming in from all over the world, we've got perspective coming in later on this afternoon. I mean, if the film offerings are good enough, people will travel I think Cambridge does have that. It also does have, and I know I'll keep on about it, it also does have somebody like Tony at the hill, who's got such a, a great reputation and such longevity in the industry, that he's able to pull in people that maybe other festivals based outside of London would maybe struggle to. I think that's credit to Tony that's out to And so for the viewers online watching this, you like quite a few people who work up to the Cambridge Film Trust and the Film Festival. Uh, Tony basically gave you a bit of a leg up in the industry to cut. Without, without him where he was then, it would have been a lot harder for everyone to be where they are now. Yeah, I mean, most people probably want Tony's shot for giving me a, a helping hand, but, you know, I, I, was, I was in a situation, I was working in the film industry, Tony is someone I'd worked with for years, I used to work in film sales. Before that I made a couple of films and Tony showed them. And Tony and I originally met because we used to have rounds, we were quite both combative, and we used to ring up and shout at each other down the phone, and it was quite good fun. 
And then I was in a situation where I got made redundant from a job. I was just about to have my first child. Um, I was a lot younger then. And I rang everybody up in the industry. And the one person who returned my call when he offered me a job starting, I think I rang him on a Thursday, he offered me a job starting on a Monday, it was Tony Jones. And without any training, he parachuted me straight in to program what was one of the best cinemas in London, the Metro Cinema, which became the other cinema. And he completely trusted me to do that. To Tony's somebody that responds well to people with a passion and a thirst and an appreciation of film. And for all of my other faults, that's something that I always had. I think Tony responded to that. And, and I'm not the only one that Tony's helped. There's been a lot of people along the way. Um, you know, Tony won't mind saying he's not always the easiest person to work with, but he's someone that's passionate. And um, I think passion is in short supply in the film industry uh, in the UK. Um, uh, and it's always good to have a bit of passion for a bit of fight. So, uh, I definitely agree with you there. So let's talk a little bit about your strand. Let's kind of just up driving business. So, we're two thirds of the way through today? We are two thirds um, of the way through today. I did see in today's copy of the I newspaper that uh, one of their things to look out for in the whole of the UK was a called Radio On and the Cambridge Outfit Cup. Terrific. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about this driving business strand and how you've come to choose these three films? Yeah, well, I, I was, um, you know, again, it's kind of given a bit of payback. Tony was very good to me in Cannes, you know, when we, we reshared the apartment, Tony let me stay in Cannes. And Tony's not somebody, you know, he didn't want any recompense and I said well let me do something at the festival for you and he said well what would you like to do and I, I'm really interested I mean I have to be honest I've just written a book with uh, a co-author Ian Hayden Smith on New British Cinema which looks at some of the new directors that have emerged in the last um, 10 years new voices and I kind of think that some of the voices that emerged before that have been kind of lost um, so I, I wanted to think of three British films that are very much formative to me my understanding of British cinema my passion for British cinema so I picked three films, um, the first of which is Radio One by Chris Pettit, which we'll say a bit more about in a minute. The second of which was Gallivant by Andrew Cotting, um, the kind of artist filmmaker uh, who unfortunately couldn't attend on Sunday because of her personal um, bereavement. And the third film was The Reflecting Skin by Philip Ridley, which we showed yesterday. The reason I like all three of these films, I think they're all very different to each other. I think they're all very, very si singular. And I think they're all very visionary. The title Driving Visions is a little bit of a misnomer because I think all three films have an element of a road movie about them. They're all films in some ways about journeys. Gallivant is certainly a kind of trek around Britain's coastline involving Andrew Cotting's uh, grandmother and his young daughter Eden. The Reflecting Skin which you showed last night um, is a kind of more of a personal journey, not a physical journey. It's a journey from um, childhood to adulthood and I was pleased that the screening was so well attended last night and Philip Ridley did a great Q&A. Radio On, I often get asked what my favourite film is of all time and, and people expect me to say Citizen Kane or Vertigo or Tokyo Story by Ozu. My actual favourite film of all time is Chris Pettit's Radio On. It's my, my, my personal favourite film of all time. I don't think it's the best film ever made but it's the film that has the most striking relationship to myself. I discovered the film when I was very, very young, and for me, and the reason I wanted to show it here, it signalled a kind of British filmmaking which we rarely see. I think it's incredibly brave, it's incredibly audacious, I can't think of anything else like it in British cinema, and I think it was made at a time, a very interesting time, when Britain was searching for its identity, politically and socially. I think Radio 1 really, really accurately reflects that. 1979, The Dawn of Thatcher. The Dawn of Thatcher, which is what the film is kind of all about. The other, no, the other reason I really like the film, and hence the, the, the title of the short season, Driving Visions, my favourite film genre, it's a sub-genre, I guess, is the road movie. And when we think of road movies, we tend to think of the American road movies, or we think of the films of Vin Vendors, the great German filmmaker from the 1970s. And Radio 1 is a film which is very much indebted to the films of Vin Vendors. It was executive produced by Vendors, and the best way to try and sell Radio 1 to anybody that might be thinking of coming to watch it is to think of it as a British version of a Vin Vendors film. I also like the film because it's got a terrific soundtrack, it features Robert Fripp, uh, Reckless Eric, Lena Lovic and David Bowie. Uh, I love the fact that the film was made on 35mm and shot in black and white. I also love the film because it starts off as a kind of thriller and then about 20 minutes in it loses all interest in having any kind of straight narrative. It's really a road movie with no direction, it's a bit of a shaggy dog story. And it's, and it's a film which goes kind of from A to Z, but it misses out quite a few other letters of the alphabet in between. Um, I probably watch Radio 1 once every three weeks, 
and every wow. time I watch it, I still get something new. And is it uh, is it due for a re-release? Yeah, or is this like the interestingly, it was, it was re-released by the BFI probably maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and it comes back to what we first started talking about. It was one of the first films I programmed at the Metro, as was, and it was, ended up being the most successful film we ever showed. So it did kind of strike a chord when it came back. People began to think, okay, well, this is a British cinema we haven't seen before, and they responded to it. And it's developed um, kind of a cult status, uh, and I think it's very deserving of that status. So it's on uh, this evening at 5:30 at the Arts Picture House, um, and if you don't get a chance to see it, then search out Radio On because it sounds fucking fantastic. It's available on BFI DVD. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Mr. Wood, for taking time with us. Uh, Always a pleasure. Thank you for and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to have a drink through the bar later on. Look forward to it. Thanks very much. Cheers, Jason. Thank you. Over and out. We are one take, that's what I like. <laughs>